you are about to embark on a self-guided healthcare journey of an elderly woman named Millie. The scenario will take place at various stages of her journey, which we hope will illustrate the 4M framework for you. Today, we have Dr. Shweta Tiwari from NSU, who's been instrumental in creating a really interesting virtual simulation that promotes the four Ms. Uh, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about your background and how you came to uh, be a part of this project. Thank you so much, John. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, very quick introduction about myself. Uh, uh, I'm an assistant professor with the Department of Geriatrics. I'm also an administrative director for a uh, HRSA-funded grant. Uh, it's Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. And the grant actually allows me the capability and capacity to promote age-friendly health system. I have worked in geriatrics for over 15 years now, and I'm really happy to be here. So this scenario follows the story of a patient through a number of different experiences that range from the emergency room, and then we're in um, the hospital room and in assisted living. And along the way, you're learning about the 4Ms. Um, and, the 4M, and what are the 4Ms? The 4Ms are mobility, mentation, medication, and what matters. Uh, basically, when a patient comes in the office, the healthcare professional team or the physician um, have to uh, incorporate their uh, plan of care with all these four M's. Falls risk have to be assessed. Mentation has to be assessed where we have the three D's, the dementia, depression, and delirium. Uh, medication, one needs to look at if the patient is being over-medicated, if there can be some kind of uh, de-prescribing. So medication management is very important. What matters, this is again very crucial, which is actually very, it's patient-based. So the physician has to explore with the patient that what really matters at this point of time in their plan of care, and that also needs to be documented. So at a high level, what were the goals of the project? So the main purpose of a project was to plan, develop, implement, and evaluate a case which is highlighting age-friendly health system which can help educate medical students. And the four M's that we just described was integrated in a case which was developed by a geriatric team. Now this case was developed in multiple phases. We used a design document which was modified through multiple edits and reviews by our interprofessional team and technical development through environment, objects, and interfaces of the application, uh, publication, and of course, there were uh, several learning outcomes. Now, the VR case itself, it displays four scenarios where an elderly patient is admitted for a hip fracture. The case study is illustrated through the VR platform as well as a YouTube video for learners who were not available to access the VR equipment. And the outcome is that the students will learn how to triage and treat patients from admission to discharge while demonstrating their knowledge of age-friendly health system. Now, the case is integrated into the geriatric curriculum for medical students and the education is ongoing. Very interesting. So what was the role of virtual simulation in helping achieve the goals of this initiative? I think, John, and even I had my reservations when I started with this whole concept, and some of the faculty still have reservations towards virtual reality. But while we have been teaching about uh, age-friendly health systems and 4Ms, and which we have been doing mostly in terms of didactics or you know, uh, patient education materials or hands-on learning in the clinic, which has been very useful. But the limiting factor is that we don't have time to teach a larger group of, you know, healthcare professionals in a short amount of time. That is one. And B, yes, it does get boring when we are repetitive over the same information again and again. And it does require faculty time also to teach some of those things. So, and with the new generation, which is the Generation Z, which we have been seeing, you know, they are more hands-on with all the technology. Uh, and we felt that the medical community is probably the right community to where basically start the virtual reality uh, portion of teaching. And also with respect to research and other literature, which I have been observing, this is one of the mechanisms through which teaching is being uh, initiated. So when I spoke to some of the faculty, they were interested in it. Uh, they have been doing it. They were just not sure how the students are going to receive it because 
I think from a historical perspective, we have done a lot of work in anatomy, which is right there in the curriculum. And this is not in the curriculum. This is something new. So the whole idea was to move from didactics, hands-on learning, which is still going to be there, but kind of blend it with the virtual reality experience. And that's how it all started. And honestly, we did actually blend it with the curriculum. Uh, our first experience was back in March, and the students loved it. Even though the, the lab space was still, I think, limited, but whoever experienced it, they liked it. And I think it's a better way of teaching the students who are more used to technology now than sitting in a classroom environment and listening to lectures. So yes, there is a facilitation portion, which the faculty does, but having the actual VR experience and learning about four M's uh, through this whole uh, you know, uh, simulation experience, I think it is very uh, engaging, it's fun, and I think they also retain more. Well, if time will tell how much they retain or not, but at that, at that point of time, I think the retention is uh, well accepted. Excellent. And how will you, are there different ways that you'll be measuring the success? So will you be surveying or how will you gather data about the participant satisfaction so, with the experience? A very good question. Yes, uh, our, we are planning to uh, measure the progress in terms of whether, you know, the students have received the knowledge which we want them to kind of retain. And we do have a feedback uh, survey, which typically is completed after the uh, simulation experience is done. Um, this time, uh, we had to kind of incorporate some questions, which we're still tweaking because it's very, very initial stages of this entire thing. But I think over a period of next four or five years, we should have some good information in terms of whether this product was useful or not. So yes, we are collecting information to your question. We are improvising the questions that we are asking and uh, we will make it mandatory as part of course completion. Excellent. Very cool. And, you know, a lot of applications, you know, virtual applications um, are sort of pre-programmed, you know, experiences that kind of go through a series of, um, you know, experiences. Um, but what, what's interesting about this one is that there's recordings, 3D recordings of an actual geriatrician. Dr. Guida um, yes. actually put on a headset and captured 3D recordings of himself going through each of these scenarios. So when you go into each scenario, you actually see him describing each of the medications and mentation, what matters most, and, and going through that whole experience. And you're hearing his voice and you're seeing his gestures and movements, and it makes it very personal. Millie is an 87-year-old female with a history of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, an indwelling Foley catheter is placed, and Millie's internist prescribes a morphine pump to control her pain and temazepam to help with sleep. Millie's daughter is upset, reporting to the nurses that her mother appears confused and disoriented. Advanced directives or advanced care planning is best discussed when there are no health care emergencies. However, many times, discussions need to be in the hospital during an acute illness. Some fall risks can be lessened by removing throw rugs and electrical cords, clearing away obstacles along the path from bed to bathroom, providing adequate lighting, repairing irregular floor surfaces, and keeping pets from underfoot. Mentation, delirium, and its impact on recovery is central to the theme of today's exercise. Medication, a powerful healthcare tool, but with attendant risks such as hypoglycemia. And finally, what matters most? We recognize the importance of the right of our elderly patient to decide for herself what is important to her in her care and her desired goals. We hope you will reflect on this scenario as you begin to care for your own patients. How, how important was that to be able to have one of the geriatricians involved with the project actually be present within the experience? I think it was extremely important and it took us some time to kind of make that decision because initially we were thinking that, you know, we can have a third person do all the recordings. But then we thought that these are the people who are actually teaching in the class. So it's easier to kind of for the students to relate to that the faculty who's actually giving us a lecture in the class 
is also doing the VR, you know, recordings. So, so that portion, I think, was uh, very important for us. Plus, Dr. Guida has a wonderful voice. So we wanted him to be, you know, part of the recording as well. And uh, yes, so I, I think that was a good decision. But it took us some time to kind of figure that this is something which we want in our virtual rea reality uh, uh, project. I do want to tell you that it is not easy because most of the geriatricians are very, very busy. So for him to do it, it really meant carving out a lot of time to go to the lab, do the recordings, and you know how difficult it is, you know, kind of going back and forth in several uh, moments. So it did take a lot of time for him to do it. But at the end, I think we were all very happy that this was done by him. Yeah, it's a very unique experience. And I could imagine that students, you know, when they're used to going through watching videos and other didactic materials, but in this case, they put on the headset and there's Dr. Guida, that's their teacher, and they feel that connection right. and they're more likely to be drawn into it and really, you know, be attentive to the lesson. So it's a really unique experience, I think. Um, and as far as access goes, you mentioned that some of the students had gone into a VR lab to actually experience it in a headset. Um, and then we also have the non-VR. So if somebody doesn't want to put on a headset for any reason, that's totally fine. They can just do the non-VR version as well. And then we also captured a video. So you could watch the experience on a video on a mobile phone and you can watch the whole scenario play out that way. So there's lots of different ways to access it. And will this be open to the public? Will anybody be able to experience this? Yes, it, it is open to public. And it, uh, to answer your question, I do want to tell you that I personally was not aware of the non-VR mode. So we only thought there was a YouTube video and there was a VR mode. So that's what the students accessed. And the students were very comfortable kind of, you know, working through the headphones, getting into the environment. It took us some time to get through the training, but the students were very comfortable. In terms of public, um, you know, access to the public, yes, it is accessible to the public. Uh, we recently presented the uh, virtual reality case and the um, with the laptop and the catechist and all of that connected at a conference and the funders were there and they experienced it and they loved it. We, we had a booth and, you know, we, we had the, the Alienware laptop and the, the gear and everything. And uh, there was a lot of traffic, John, I do have to tell you. It was a very successful booth for us at AGS this time. And... Uh, since uh, since it was liked so much, that's the reason we're trying to present it to HRSA again, uh, you know, in the next two months. But yes, it is open to public. Excellent. And for anybody watching, we'll be sharing, if you look at the description of this video, wherever you're watching it, whether it's on YouTube or Vimeo or our website, um, we'll include a link somewhere in the description or on the website that will give you a direct link into the experience as well as a place where you can watch the video and you can go follow the story of Millie through uh, her experience in this, in this application. Um, you mentioned that it was it was really well received. What do you see the the future of virtual simulation as far as raising awareness of the four M's uh, concept? I I think the future of virtual simulation is good, but at the same time, I think it has to be a blended teaching. I don't think that virtual reality in itself will be able to. Uh, get to the point where we want our healthcare professionals to be, which is kind of, you know, uh, making them aware of what's going on. I always think that a third person, which is who is teaching or who's aware of these things, kind of has to facilitate the virtual reality. I don't think standalone in itself, it's going to do a lot of, um, you know, um, awareness or education as we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. It's a, a way to support and augment and, and reinforce yes, and yes. provide an engaging way to experience it. But it's definitely not going to be something that will replace the in-person right, teaching. Right. It's more like a teaching it. tool. It's more mm -hmm. like a teaching tool. And students need that, you know, as I said, apart from the didactics, which can sometimes be boring. Uh, you know, if you have a virtual simulation or a virtual reality uh, product, it kind of makes it more interesting. And, and you, you learn better. Some people learn better just by different teaching modalities. So going forward, um, if this initiative is successful at a very high level, um, what are some of the outcomes that you would expect kind of overall, you know, it's about raising awareness of these forums is, you know, are there are there specific outcomes at a high level that you would expect to start to see for the care of geriatric patients? 
So I think there has to be a trust in terms of why 4Ms is essential uh, for patient care. Once that is established and, you know, basically our healthcare workforce is practicing that, at that point, I think this will be a very quick tool to, uh, you know, further educate our, uh, our students, our residents, our physicians, our workforce, nursing workforce, you know, physician workforce. At that point, I think it will be a very important tool. But I think the first step is really kind of getting the buy-in that this is something which is important uh, for a physician or for a uh, for a healthcare professional to take into account when they're seeing a patient. If all this is accounted, yes, there is a lot of improvement in patient outcomes. We are anticipating that there will be, you know, less hospitalizations. Uh, there is, if you go to the Age-Friendly Health System website by Institute of Healthcare Improvement, you will see they have a business case where actually we are reducing cost, we're reducing hospitalization, you know, and a lot of good stuff when this is actually in um, implementation. However, I don't think that we are there yet. So since we're not there yet, only from the 4Ms perspective, I don't think I can count virtual reality at that point that it is going to promise us uh, at a different level altogether. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So it's, it's a very, the 4Ms in and of itself, raising awareness of that is the first step. It's beyond, you know, before we even get to whether we can roll out, you know, virtual reality at scale, just raising right. awareness of 4Ms. And again, the virtual simulation is just a tool to help augment and support and push that forward. Um, but it seems like there's multiple tiers there. It's like, first, we, we really need to get people aware of the 4Ms to improve patient right. safety. In order right. to do that, we need to raise awareness and we're trying to create the most engaging experiences um, possible so that it's, reten you know, they're retaining what they're learning, they're interested, it's, it's fun and, and interactive. So uh, it seems like there's multiple layers to the to the rollout. Right, right. And you know, we are 48 GWEPs and all of them are doing wonderful work in raising awareness. It's the buy-in, which is really the issue because everything is associated with cost. So once we have leadership buy-in and they think that this is something which they really want to kind of implement, then the virtual reality is, you know, I think it's one of the, one of the greatest teaching tool which can help us achieve this at a very low, um, I won't say low cost because there is a cost here, you know, which is, mm -hmm. uh, involved in this, but uh, in less time. So I would say time time would be a big advantage over here. In less time, I think people can receive a lot of information. And what are the, the other team members that are involved with the project? There were a number of collaborators involved with creating this, and, and who were they, and what was, what was their involvement with the project? So I do want to be honest that the virtual reality concept was very, very new and innovative way for us uh, to just to get adjusted to this. It took us some time and Dr. Liz Oviavi gave that time to us. So I do want to thank her for uh, being an excellent collaborator and leading us into this initiative. Uh, our uh, geriatric team, Dr. Nashira Pandya, Dr. Vincent Guida and Dr. Hadi Masri, all three of them were deeply involved in the case from the beginning to the end. Uh, they wrote the 4Ms case. They conceptualized Millie and how she went from one system of care to the other system of care and what obstacles she would have faced. And we kind of brainstormed together, you know, how to make this as a good learning experience for a student who is encountered uh, with a situation like Millie and how to kind of implement 4Ms uh, on this patient. So yes, our geriatric team was uh, very valuable. Our GWEP team um, was always available to organize, uh, you know, meetings or uh, scheduling uh, recordings or, uh, you know, other, other uh, hands-on work which goes on with uh, making this product uh, work better. Uh, of course, you, John, you helped us from the very beginning. I mean, we had no training, you know, how to use those headsets. I mean, I'm honestly, it took us two hours for like three of us sitting in that lab and, you know, making it work uh, and learning the terminology. I mean, all the terminology was new for me as well. Um, so, yeah, you have been really instrumental in kind of helping us uh, go from one step to the other. Our leadership, uh, I would really, th I'm very thankful to our leadership. I am very thankful to our other stakeholders who 
who who were okay with this concept and who helped us uh, kind of um, or who motivated us to to make this work so i'm thankful to our leadership and our stakeholder as well excellent well this has been very exciting to hear your story and to learn more about the 4m's project and i really appreciate you taking the time to to meet with us today thank you so much john and thank you for having me <laughs>